Live from San Jose, California, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering Hadoop Summit 2016, brought to you by Hortonworks. Here's your host, George Gilbert. Welcome back to theCUBE. My name's George Gilbert. We're here at Hadoop Summit in the San Jose Convention Center. Uh, and we're here with Sri Raghavan, a uh, distinguished uh, guest from Teradata, and uh, actually fresh off a Teradata Influencer Summit a couple weeks ago. That's correct. So Sri, a um, couple things to talk about. Um, Teradata we've known for having the best decision support database, big iron, you know, flex the performance muscles. They're changing their stripes. Tell us how. First of all, George, um, thanks for having me here and Teradata here. We're very happy to be here. We have a lot of respect for Wikibon and theCUBE. So it's great to be back here with uh, other people having participated in various parts of it. So, you know, Teradata has, um, um, of course, as you mentioned, we've been in business for 30 years and we started off doing a lot of work around the enterprise data warehouse. We've actually had a very substantial big data uh, solutions as well as practice for the past um, you know, five plus years. So you know, we've been very active, we've been putting out solutions, we've got a lot of customers who have purchased um, our big data solutions. Uh, in particular, uh, the one that I'm representing today in the company is this one called the Astra Analytics Solutions. It's a, what we call the multi-genre advanced analytics solution. And it is something we're very proud of and we've had a lot of customers and so, you know, that has been central to the big data story that we're, we've been telling, we've been trying to tell, and we've been very successful with it. So that was, Aster became part of Teradata's pivot to big data when when you did the acquisition, which was right. what year? Um, the acquisition was in 2011, so it's roughly going on about five years now. Okay. Yeah. So, um, everyone's talking about now analytics, you know, predictive analytics, machine learning. Yep. What's What's Teradata saying to its customers and its prospects about how it can help them on that journey? Yeah, um, so typically, you know, whenever we start having these conversations with prospects and customers, the, the question has never been about um, technology. We never approach it from the standpoint of, hey, look, we have this great technology called Aster, and we've got this integration with Hadoop, and we've got machine learning graph and text and sentiment and what have you. We typically try to approach it from the standpoint of, hey, um, let's first try to figure out what business problems a particular customer or organization has. So it's the, the uh, conversations, the vernacular, has always been in that, in that vein. And our goal is to provide, uh, to, to be the best advisors that we possibly can be to the customers towards resolving these kinds of questions. So let me give you an example, right? Um, a couple of years ago, we, you know, one of our big customers today, um, they had a, you know, the first question they had was around, hey, a lot of our customers are churning. This was a big bank. And so, but they didn't, they couldn't quite figure out what their, the, their rationale was behind all this churn that was occurring. And so the kinds of questions that we asked them was more around, okay, what are the different kinds of, you know, channels that you have through which your customers interact with you? And they came back and said, well, you know, we have people who come directly to our branches. Uh, we have people who actually come and engage with us in through the web, through our substantive and substantial digital presence. They also talked about how people call up their call centers and, and talk to them and all that. So we did, uh, we looked at, you know, these are completely disparate sources of data that come through these channels. And the idea is, you know, we started looking at the various paths that people take when they interact with the bank through these channels. And we did a path analysis. You know, we have our own patented Path, pathing algorithm called NPATH, which we applied to this issue to be able to determine, hey, what are some of the antecedent conditions to churn? Okay. What are the four or five things that people do before they say, they throw in their hat and say, look, I, I don't want you to be a part of your bank anymore. So for us to be able to understand that there was a churn problem was very important, which then subsequently gave birth to a number of business questions. For churn to occur, people must be interacting with you. Okay, if they interact with you, how do they interact with you? 
what are the different frequencies with which they interact? So then we start asking questions about where's the data located? What does the data look like? Are they all the same data? How do we bring them together? Then we start, that's when we start bringing the technology piece into it. So okay. to answer your question in a, in, a, in a fairly elliptical manner, it's about the business problem, then we focus on the process, and then it's only then do we care about the technology and bring that in. So, um, how long did this engagement take, and sort of what technologies did you have to bring to bear? Yeah. yeah. And and who ultimately was the customer? You're right. Um, so the question um, in terms of you know how quickly we were able to do it, and you know of course um, the, one of the first unsatisfactory answers is that of course it depends on the use case. But typically we've been able to resolve these things sometimes from a matter of hours to typically uh, one or two days, uh, where we're able to show some material difference between um, the, the, the pre-solution days where we were we we went in and, and explained our solution to where we are today. So that. The, the amount of time spent is, is, is very short. Of course, there are many other use cases that get built on top of that, and that extends engagement quite a bit and all that, right? So typically, on average, it's, it's a matter of days before we show very, very good progress. Now, the question as to who typically consumes it, and again, this is where it goes back to the whole point of leading with a business question, because typically, a lot of these questions are asked by the business. I mean, most of the time, you know, in the past, when uh, the conversations happen around big data technologies, it's always how do we how do we talk to the IT about about uh -huh. delivering the solution. But you know, as as I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, and you've seen it yourself, a lot of these conversations are generated. They're, they've begun with the business side of the organization. Guys who are responsible for customer satisfaction, uh, or people who are responsible for um, getting um, re customer retention, or to increase new members. Uh, when, I, when I used to work as part of JP Morgan Chase back in the day, one of my areas of responsibility was custom, new customer acquisition. I, as, as, as a person who was responsible for delivering insights into customer acquisitions, it was my job to be able to recommend to the business, hey, these are the four or five strategies that we are able to recommend based on the insights we got from the analytics. Would, in, in the case of JP Morgan, you might not have had that technology to bring to bear, yes. but you would have had a path, a favored or an optimized path, yeah. I assume. Chet, yeah. take us back to this bank. Where where did you find the, the breakdowns where they were experiencing events that led to churn? Yeah, and, and, and that, that the answer to this question is never obvious up front, right? Because all you do know is, as a point of visibility, the only thing that that is at least intuitively available to you to look at is the fact that somebody walks into your bank and says, hey, I'd like to close my accounts with you today. So typically, that is your, your first view into the extent to which the customer uh, you know, has been affected by your services or the lack thereof. Now, of course, there are many other way stations that the customer has passed with you in their interactions with you. So it could be that potentially they'd come back at some point in time in the prior to that moment and said, look, I really am very upset with the fact that you charged me 30 bucks for, you know, for this check which got bounced and I have $10,000 in my savings account. You can't really do this, it's terrible and all that, right? So having said that, then what they realize is, look, I know today has been the culmination of a lot of events. So that's when you start looking at what are those four or five events right. that, that have occurred. And that's when you start looking at there are, we have, let's say, five million customers. Now obviously every customer has a certain path. You know, there's, everybody's idiosyncratic in terms of how they interact with any given institution. But what we look at is among the five million customers, is there any chance for you to be able to uh, crystallize five paths that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a standard 80-20 um, Pareto yeah. rule yeah. kind of thing, right? where look, five paths account for 80% of the churn customers, meaning that there are you know six or seven things that happen in these five paths. Every time we need to consider when a new customer starts going on that path, then we start flagging them and, and, and go on. Here's the other thing that's important with the bank did, and, and, and I'll, I'll let you ask a question, but this is an important point. Not every customer needs to be given the same level of service, right? And the bank, sometimes, you know, the bank comes and tells us, look, 
we realize you're upset as a customer. We get it, right? But then you also have to be realistic. You are very upset with us, but you have $5 in your checking account. You overdraw your account maybe 15 times a year and you don't really keep any substantive amount of balance. So really, the fact that you're upset with us really bothers us, but frankly, it is not worth our while to make you happy because where is the bank for the buck going to be in the sense right. that you're not going to be profitable over time? So these are some of the questions. That's when the insights are available to you and you operationalize them by taking certain other things like, okay, what's the lifetime value of this customer? Right. So these are some of the things you do to be able to um, deliver uh, proper uh, value to the company, and we do a lot of that. Okay, and now you have a broader, a much broader range of tools. It's not just raw database. Correct. It's the consulting and uh, the analytics to bring these Correct. increasingly repeatable solutions Absolutely. to bear. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, one of the, you know, you ask a very important question, um, George. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, really smart guy by the name of John Thuma, one of the things he tells me all the time, look, um, we are in the business of delivering what he calls human analytics. And, you know, the term is a great term. You know, I've always thought of that, uh, but I've never used that term. And, and, and he's absolutely right. Here's the deal. Our job is to be able to provide analytics, not just for those, you know, four and a half data scientists that you have in your payroll, yeah. right? So, so to that extent, we want to be able to have the entire organization be part of this data-driven journey. What does it mean? Which right. means that, okay, I need the line of business manager to be able to develop certain decisions based on the right. data that she is able to see. Right. I need the head of insights to also do the same thing. I need the CEO of the corporation. Now, how do you do that? Well, one of the ways by which you do that is to provide a solution where you're not restricted by your knowledge or no knowledge right. of being able to code in, let's say, Java, Perl, C++, right. Python, and so on, right? So the deal here is for you to be able to say, okay, as a company, are we providing certain apps that people with, with good visual interfaces that you can click and paste, right. uh, or rather which you can drag and drop right. to be able to get to, you know, uh, being able to right. execute certain analytics which run in the back end. And so that's exactly the trajectory that we've taken as a company, to provide solutions right. where you have the ability to be able to implement them without knowing what the inner plumbing looks like. Okay. That's a holy grail. And, for us. So let's leave it at that point as as part one, and uh, ah. we will pick, pick that thread up in a part two interview at, at our next show. Um, but that is, it's a, it's um, a much more solutions-oriented message, obviously, with Teradata no longer being a database supplier, but a trusted advisor. Um, and sounds really intriguing to, you know, yes. get one, one le level more. All right, this is George Gilbert. We're at the Hadoop Summit 2016 San Jose Convention Center, and we'll be right back after this. Thanks.